We have made clear that providing material support to Russia or assist or assistance with any type of systemic sanctions evasion would be a very serious concern to us. And we will certainly continue to make clear to the Chinese uh, government and to companies and banks in their jurisdiction uh, about what the rules are regarding our sanctions and the serious consequences they would face for violating them. Our economic assistance is making Ukraine's resistance possible by supporting the home front, funding critical public services, and helping keep the government running. In the coming months, we expect to provide around $10 billion in additional economic support for Ukraine. As President Biden has said, we will stand with Ukraine in its fight for as long as it takes. This is my first video update from Athens, Greece on this Friday morning. Let's talk about some news. And so that was uh, Boris Johnson in India. He was uh, threatening the, uh, the Chinese to stop supporting Russia or else. And that's a pretty, pretty strong threat coming from the former British Prime Minister. And then Boris Johnson announced that uh, the United States would be giving $10 billion in, uh, in aid to Ukraine. Now, why Boris Johnson is, is making uh, financial economic decisions for the United States, I don't know. But uh, Boris Johnson, you know, he, he didn't look too well. His hair definitely got, uh, got pretty gray since he, since he was a British Prime Minister. Not sure what's, what's going on with Boris Johnson, but he just didn't look the same <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, Boris Johnson did, uh, did announce that uh, he is going to be, he is going to be, uh, I don't know, what is it, running? He's gonna throw his hat in the ring for, uh, for the NATO Secretary General. This should be my clown world, but uh, this was expected from uh, Boris Johnson. He he hinted at the fact that uh, he wanted to be the NATO Secretary General once uh, Stoltenberg left uh, his post. And uh, yeah, why not? You know, Boris Johnson, he's uh, he'd be the perfect uh, guy for the job, I think. Well, almost the perfect. He doesn't. The one thing that Boris Johnson, well, there's two boxes that Boris Johnson doesn't tick. He's not, uh, he's not uh, female, and he's, uh, I, I don't think at least, I don't think he has a type of Bandera past like some other candidates or uh, alleged candidates have. <laughs> Freeland. Um, <laughs> So I think he, he misses two check boxes that uh, another another candidate that there's a lot of talk about fulfills. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think everyone knows who I'm talking about. But um, other than that, you know, he's he'd be perfect for for the job of NATO Secretary General. He's he's just as just as dumb as Stoltenberg, just as hawkish. Just as uh, clownish as, more clownish than Stoltenberg, actually. I think he adds a certain clown aura to the, uh, to the position of, of Secretary General. You know, Stoltenberg is, is a little too, too serious at times. So I think that, that Bojo would, would add a nice clownish aura atmosphere to the, to the position of uh, Secretary General at NATO. And, and I think that Boris, being the absolutely awful manager and administrator that uh, we know him to be. I think he would do a really good job of running NATO into the ground. So why not Boris for the, uh, the top position at NATO? He's got my vote. 
if if that's how it works <laughs> it doesn't work by vote but anyway if i was going to vote yeah i'd vote for boris why not rishi sunak his uh not his immediate successor but the uh the prime minister after after boris and then after liz trust well rishi sunak he came out with a statement and he said that he's uh, urging all of the uh, g7 countries to provide weapons that can uh, that can attack deep inside of russia that's what he uh that's what he would like to see from the g7 countries that can strike at the russian rear that is according to the uh to the statements and wishes of the unelected british prime minister rishi sunak <laughs> unelected no one voted for the guy but you know he's he's gonna take the uk straight into uh into conflict with russia <laughs> because that's how democracy works right <laughs> you you get the unelected guy to to lead your country into into war so um <laughs> victoria newland she's She's making the rounds on uh, mainstream media. She's actually, the last couple of days, she's been on uh, giving interviews to the Washington Post. She's, uh, she's been uh, interviewed on CNN, and she's doing a lot of talking. Victoria Newland is doing a lot of talking. And, you know, before, before all of these interviews, Victoria Newland was kind of operating in the shadows. A lot of people really didn't know who, who Newland was. I mean... We know her because, you know, we follow this stuff. Everyone that's watching this channel, we knew all about her. We knew all about her. F the EU telephone call with Pyatt in 2014. We knew all about her cookies and, and bread and snacks and treats that she was passing out in, in Maidan during the, uh, the Obama EU coup in Ukraine. But uh, many other people, everyday people, say that aren't into geopolitics. They didn't really know who Newland was. Until, until Elon Musk decided to, uh, to tweet about Newland. Yep, Elon Musk, he kind of blew Newland's cover because Newland liked it to operate in the shadows. She liked to cause, uh, to cause chaos and catastrophe while in the shadows and behind the curtains of the, of the State Department. Never the Secretary of State, but always one of those those secondary uh, positions where she could operate with uh, with a lot of anonymity, anonymity. And uh, and Elon Musk, well, he kind of he kind of outed uh, Victoria Newland in a big, big way. And Jordan Peterson, he put out a tweet the other day and he was referencing a Newsweek article, this Newsweek article that uh, Peterson was referencing was an article about um, a Russian, like a, a very hawkish Russian media personality. I forgot the guy's name. Anyway, he, uh, this Russian media TV personality, he was, uh, he was basically saying on Russian TV that because the, uh, the US, the Biden administration is, is talking about striking at Crimea, that, uh, that this is a type of declaration of war and Peterson saw this article on Newsweek. Why Peterson is reading Newsweek, I don't know. But uh, that's not a good sign for Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, the fact that he's trusting Newsweek. But um, he, he referenced this article and he tweeted WTF at POTUS, kind of trying to grab the attention of, of Biden, because we know that Biden is constantly checking his, his Twitter account. <laughs> Biden's on on top of his social media, but um, he tweets that that message to at POTUS WTF, and then Elon Musk uh, replies to that tweet, and Elon Musk says, and he tweets back at at Jordan V Peterson and at POTUS. Elon Musk says nobody is pushing this war more than Newland. Wow. Nobody is pushing this war more than Newland. So that's going to get seen by millions and upon millions of people. And I'm sure millions of people are going to say Newland. What's a Newland? <laughs> What's a Newland? Who's a Newland? And they're going to do their research and they're going to find out all kinds of interesting things about F the EU cookies and, and, uh, and cake at, uh, at the Maidan. They're going to find out all kinds of interesting things about Newland, and perhaps they're also going to uh, 
to find out that Newland was one of the, the key the key decision makers in uh, in the blowing up of the Nord Stream pipeline, according to the uh, investigative journalism of Seymour Hirsch. So Newland is going around now and she's she's in damage control mode and she's giving interviews and she's saying, OK, I've been outed by Elon Musk. Now, every every American, everyone in the world who really isn't into politics or geopolitics is going to kind of know who I am. And they're going to know that I'm the one that's pulling the strings in the conflict in Ukraine. I'm Alensky's puppet master and I'm the person pretty much I'm the person that's driving this crazy train towards uh, World War Three. And so she's uh, she's giving interviews and she said that that uh, an investigation into Nord Stream, the pipeline sabotage is really not the choice of the U.S. She said it's not our choice. She said it's the choice of uh, of the Europeans. It's their decision, she said, this is her, her quote. It is their decision whether or not Russia should participate, not ours, if Russia should participate in a type of investigation into Nord Stream. And uh, Newland said that an investigation, that there is an investigation underway by the parties and the countries that surround that peace. We will know when that investigation is complete. But then Newland said that uh, she wants to tell everybody, she said, I want to say definitively here that the United States had nothing to do with this explosion. Zero. That is what Newland told. Um, I believe this was an interview to, to CNN, either CNN or the Washington Post. I know she's been giving interviews all over the place now. And uh, she also told this, this she told the Washington Post. She told the Washington Post that uh, there's going to be more sanctions against Russia. They're going to be announced today to mark the one year anniversary of of the conflict in Ukraine. And she also said that uh, the United States is trying to figure out a way to get fourth and fifth generation fighter jets to uh, to Ukraine as well. That's something else that. Victoria Newland is working on escalation. She's working on on escalation. I'm trying to see if I have the, the quote from uh, Victoria Newland handy. I don't think I have it handy, but yeah, I'll, I'll find it and I'll put it up on the screen in uh, in post production. So she's just looking to to ramp things up in uh, in Ukraine. Her dream has always been the destruction of Russia. And uh, she, she senses that now is, is her, her opportunity to make her dreams come true. She's just Victoria Newland. She's just, you know, your, your average, your average uh, girl with a dream. And that dream has been to destroy Russia. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, she's got a dream. And now she's trying to make her dream come true. That's uh, Victoria Newland. But good on Elon Musk, in all seriousness. Good on Elon Musk for, uh, for outing her. I mean, you know, once again, we all know Newland. We know her history. We know what she's involved in and everything that she's doing. But the, the rest of the world, like 99% of everybody that's not following this story in, in so much uh, detail, they have no idea who Newland is. And, and now they, they will. And that's why she's, she's coming out on all of the TV channels and giving all of these interviews. She's... Uh, She's in damage control mode because Elon Musk pretty much said that she's the one that's going to bring the world towards a catastrophic war. She's the one pushing the U.S. over the cliff. So, Nord Stream. Let's talk about Nord Stream since we're talking about Cookies Newland. And, uh, and there was a U.N. hearing, a security, a security Council uh, meeting. Um, around Nord Stream, and this was called by the, by the Russians. And the Chinese supported this, by the way. And the Russians called the Security Council meeting, and they brought in two experts to, to give their thoughts, their statements on, uh, on Nord Stream. And those, those experts were Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who has appeared on the Duran two times, and uh, Ray McGovern, former CIA analyst Ray McGovern, who I believe Alexander Mercurius has done shows with, uh, 
with Mr. McGovern, and it would be great to get uh, Ray McGovern onto the Duran as well. But uh, they gave their, their testimony, they gave their thoughts as to what happened with the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipeline and what needs to happen going forward, which is an investigation and an investigation by, by the UN, by impartial third party investigation. And, uh, and Jeffrey Sachs actually brought up a really good point. He, uh, he mentioned the fact that Sweden actually did do an investigation. Actually, Sweden, Denmark, and Germany at one point had a joint investigation when Nord Stream was first blown up. And uh, then, they, then they disbanded and they decided to go their own way and do their own separate investigations. And Sweden actually had divers on the scene. They went down there, they took a look, and uh, then they shut down their investigation. They got whatever info they wanted. And they said, we're not going to release our findings to anybody. And uh, Professor Sachs, he said, why? I mean, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but he's like, why? Why isn't Sweden letting us know what exactly they found? Yeah, why? Why Sweden? Sweden should, should release their information. Unless, of course, Sweden is being pressured by, say, uh, a very powerful uh, country that may have been involved in this sabotage and they're looking to, to cover it up or perhaps Jeffrey Sa or perhaps uh, uh, Seymour Hirsch was correct when he noted that Sweden was also brought into this plot via Norway to uh, to cover up the the sabotage of Nord Stream it's it's very odd that Sweden may have an idea as to uh, what went on in the, uh, in the Baltic, in the Baltic Sea, but they don't want to release that information for some reason. Wasn't Sweden the country that first got the ball rolling in the persecution of uh, Julian Assange? I think that was Sweden as well that, uh, that got that thing underway against Julian Assange. But the point is that uh, we have had Three countries investigate Nord Stream, and we have had divers in the Baltic take a look at what's going on, and for some reason, they don't want to let us know what they found. So those were really good testimonies, excellent testimonies, statements, analysis from, uh, from Jeffrey Sachs and from Ray McGovern. What I will do is I will put a link to the, uh, the video of their testimonies, of their statements. And uh, I'm not sure if you call it testimony or statements or speeches, but I'll put a link to what they said at the uh, Security Council in the description box down below. And uh, I always check the benches to make sure they're, <laughs> they're, they're clean to sit down on. Um, and I'll put a link to, to that, uh, to that UN Security Council meeting in the description box. It's the uh, the channel of Consortium News. They have, actually they have the whole hour and a half session. And I'll put that down below so you can take a look and uh, listen to what uh, Jeffrey Sachs and Ray McGovern had to say. Sticking with, uh, with Nord Stream, staying with Nord Stream and Seymour Hirsch. Seymour Hirsch, he wrote a Substack article a couple of days ago. And in this article, Seymour Hirsch asks the question, what I believe is a very relevant question, which is why Norway? Why did the United States decide to choose Norway? Yes, there were, there were various allied, say ally friendship reasons, trust reasons why they, why they chose Norway, Norway being a trusted partner of the United States, Norway being, being a country that's in, in that region of the Baltic Sea. And, uh, and, and the, the energy financial benefits for Norway as well. We have all of those things in, uh, that, that were considered by the Biden White House when they decided to go with Norway as well as, as their expertise. In, uh, in these types of, of diving, let's say diving underwater energy gas pipeline situations. But uh, Seymour Hirsch also goes a bit into the history of, 
of sabotage and cooperation between, uh, let's say, false flag, the history of false flag or, or war escalation between Norway and the United States. And he references Vietnam, and he put out a Substack article with the title, From the Gulf of Tonkin to the Baltic Sea. Now I'm going to put a link to this article down below, but let me read you the first two paragraphs of this article, short paragraphs, and you can see, you can read the rest of the article. Um, just follow the link in the description box. Why Norway, in my account of the Biden administration's decision to destroy the Nord Stream pipelines, why did much of the secret planning and training for the operation take place in Norway? And why were highly skilled seamen and technicians from the Norwegian Navy involved? The simple answer is that the Norwegian Navy has a long and murky history of cooperation with American intelligence. Five months ago, that teamwork, about which we still know very little, resulted in the destruction of two pipelines on orders of President Biden, with international implications yet to be determined. And six decades ago, so the histories of those years have it, a small group of Norwegian seamen were entangled in a presidential deceit that led to an early and bloody turning point in the Vietnam War. The more things change, the more they stay the same. So um, Seymour Hirsch goes through the history of U.S.-Norway cooperation and, and uh, its, its effects on, on Vietnam and the Vietnam War. And it's kind of tied all together with, with what happened recently in, uh, in the Baltic Sea. And, the Biden administration working with Norway to to allegedly blow up the uh, the Nord Stream pipeline. Let's talk about Moldova now. Let's shift gears and talk about Moldova. And then I've got a couple of clown worlds, even though my Boris Johnson, uh, Boris Johnson looking to become the NATO secretary general is a clown world, without a doubt, is a clown world. I've still got two more clown worlds to get to as well. But let's just talk real, real quickly, real briefly on um, what's going on in Moldova and Transnistria, because we are getting reports. Many of these reports are coming from the Russian Ministry of Defense that uh, Ukraine, uh, Azov guys, Ukraine military, is looking to, uh, to do something in Transnistria and Moldova seems to be in on it. The new prime minister of Moldova, he came out with a statement saying that, uh, that the Russian uh, peacekeeping force, which is around, I believe the total force in Transnistria is something like 1,000, 1,200, 1,100 uh, troops. He said that those Russian forces, those peacekeepers, and they are peacekeepers, uh, internationally recognized, I believe they're internationally recognized peacekeepers, that they have to leave Transnistria. And uh, right after the new prime minister came out with this, uh, this ultimatum to, uh, to Russia, we started getting reports coming from the Russian, from Russian intel and the Russian Ministry of Defense that uh, Ukraine is planning some sort of an attack or some sort of provocation in Transnistria in order to well, two, two reasons, to remove the Russian peacekeepers and perhaps create a second front, as well as perhaps getting, getting to this really big uh, ammo warehouse, which, which is uh, in Transnistria. Allegedly, this is a huge uh, warehouse of ammunition. It's, uh, it's, it was created in the 1940s and from from what I understand, this, this, uh, this warehouse has something like 20,000 20, tons, something like that, of, of artillery and of ammunition, artillery, uh, inf infantry, and other, other equipment, other military equipment. It's, 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 a big, it's a big warehouse with a lot, of, a lot of weapons, let's just put it that way. Uh, no one really knows. To be quite honest, I don't think anyone really knows how big 
how big this is. I mean, it's big, but no one knows how big this warehouse of ammo really is or in what condition uh, all the all the equipment is in this in this warehouse. I would imagine that after so many decades, a lot of stuff is just not not up to uh, up to par. But I would also imagine that over the many de over the many de decades, I would think that over the many decades, the Russian uh, forces in Transnistria dealt with this ammunition, disposed of it. I don't know. I I'm not sure. Maybe not. Maybe they kept this warehouse, you know, there in intact with everything in it. But uh, there's no doubt that a Ukraine military, which is running low on ammo, even though they're telling us that it's the Russians that are running low on ammo and they need to help the Chinese. The real facts are that the Ukraine military is running out of ammo. And I imagine that in this uh, desperation to get ammo to the Ukraine military, they might try such a such a dumb, stupid thing like going after Transnistria. And so that's the fear that some sort of provocation is going to happen there. And uh, this has allegedly this has the support of the of the president, Maya Sandu, a very unpopular president who blames everything on Russia. Very, she's very much in tune, very much uh, in line with her other young WEF leaders that are that are running the the collective West. She's always blaming the uh, the problems of of her terrible management as president. She blames it on Russia. That's that's her go-to, her go-to uh, boogeyman. And uh, that this this provocation has the support of the president, has the prime minister. Allegedly, the EU is in on it. Allegedly, NATO, perhaps Romania. I mean, they're all from what from what I understand, they're all in on on this possible provocation. I don't know if it's going to happen. Once again, this is coming from the Russian uh, side of things, the Russian Ministry of Defense and Russian Intel. Who knows? But. We are getting reports of a lot of troop activity, Azov activity in that area, and perhaps they're going to do something. Maybe the maybe it'll just be the Ukraine military. Maybe it'll be the Ukraine military and Moldova. Maybe Romania is going to jump in, but uh, the Russians are not going to leave this unanswered. NATO may think that they could be opening up a second front. They may think that Russia's distracted and now's the time to strike in uh, Transnistria. Maybe they. They actually believe that they can get their hands on on all of this this uh, military equipment in Transnistria. Maybe a lot's going on here. Maybe there's a lot of different different ideas and hopes that the uh, the collective West has with with Transnistria, and that's why they're going ahead with this attack. But or alleged alleged attack that uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense is talking about. But I don't think Russia would leave this unanswered. I don't think Russia's just going to sit there and say, well. You know, we're, we're distracted in Ukraine and we're just going to let let whatever happens to Transnistria happen. That's not going to be the case. This is a very stupid and dangerous idea. If this is true, if this is true, this is a very dangerous and stupid idea uh, by Ukraine, by Moldova and by NATO. But, you know, they're they're full of stupid, crazy and now desperate, desperate ideas. They're very desperate. Even Stoltenberg said the other day in an interview that uh, that NATO can't keep up with uh, with Russia. He said that this war is now a war of attrition. Uh, yeah, duh. I think we've been saying that for for a good nine months now. But Stoltenberg is now saying this is a war of, of attrition and and artillery and ammo and NATO simply can't keep up. He said that this is a war of logistics as well. So this is a, uh, this war is all about logistics and NATO just can't, they can't produce the ammo. They can't produce the, the, the hardware that's needed to fight Russia. And uh, he's raising the, the, uh, or he's ringing, ringing the alarm bells. That's uh, that was Stoltenberg's comments with, with his revelation on the war. Oh, he, he was speaking to CNN's Christiane Amanpour. I pulled up the article right now. Christiane Amanpour. She's a very sophisticated journalist and international correspondent. Christiane Amanpour. I'm Christiane Amanpour. I'm a very sophisticated journalist. Very, very sophisticated journalist and war correspondent. Christiane Amanpour. 
uh, he was speaking to Christian Amalpur and uh, Stoltenberg. Yeah, he said that this is a war of attrition. He said that the West should not underestimate Russia's firepower advantage. He said that Ukraine's ammo consumption is higher than NATO's total production. And uh, he said that this situation cannot continue. So far, we have depleted our stocks. But at some stage, we need to get more ammunition produced, he told Amalpur. That's what he told Christian Amalpur. <laughs> oh, don't worry about it, Stoltenberg. Boris Johnson's going to handle it. <laughs> Bojo is a master of logistics, isn't he? <laughs> isn't Boris Johnson a master administrator, a master manager? He's, he's an expert on all this logistic, military, war of attrition stuff. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Boris Johnson will take care of it. Anyway, let's do a clown world. <laughs> oh, boy. So many clown worlds to choose from. A lot of clown worlds to choose from. Let's see here. With the European Commission, they're banning TikTok. <laughs> the European Commission has ordered its employees to uninstall the popular Chinese-owned social media app TikTok from corporate devices, explaining the move as necessary to bolster cybersecurity. To protect the EC's data and increase its cybersecurity, its management board has decided to suspend the TikTok application on corporate devices and personal devices enrolled in the Commission mobile device services, according to a statement posted by the body on Thursday. Way to go, Ursula, making those tough decisions <laughs> to ban TikTok. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and <laughs> what, a, what a circus. What a circus. And our main clown world is... Uh, <laughs> this one is... Man, this clown world. <laughs> this one. Disgraced Biden official photographed in stolen clothes. Sam Brinton, the non-binary nuclear engineer, fired from the Biden administration after being charged with stealing suitcases from two airports, has been accused of stealing from a third woman and even wearing her custom-designed clothes to public events. Houston-based Tanzanian fashion designer Asia Kamzin tweeted an image of the former Department of Energy official wearing a red dress with black print alongside a photo of herself wearing what appears to be the same garment on Monday, revealing she had lost her suitcase full of custom designs on a 2018 Delta Airlines flight to Washington, D.C. and never recovered it. In the following days, Compson tweeted several more images of Brinton in what appeared to be her clothes. The sticky-fingered scientist even wore her jewelry, she tweeted on Thursday. One of the photos that has surfaced was even used in a Vanity Fair feature about the flamboyant figure's style. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, the Biden White House, they're, they're absolutely, this is, this is absolutely the right administration to take the United States into a war with Russia and China. Absolutely, this is the right administration. No doubt about it. <laughs> Let's see her tweet. Asia Kamsin tweeted, My name is Asia Kamsin, Tanzanian fashion designer based in Houston, Texas, USA. I lost my bag in 2018 in DCA. Recently, I heard the news on Fox News about Sam Brinton luggage issue. Surprisingly, I found his, image, I found his images wore my custom-made outfits which was in the lost bag on 2018. <laughs> can't make this stuff up, <laughs> man. You can't make this stuff up. I have no comment. I had a whole bunch of clown worlds today. I started off with the clown world featuring Boris Johnson. <laughs> that was Janet Yellen, by the, by the way. But when I saw Janet Yellen speaking in India, and, and she's going to give another $10 billion to to Ukraine because, well, you know, nothing's happening in Ohio. <laughs> nothing's going on in Ohio. Just don't, don't, don't worry about that. Pete Buda, Buttigieg is on the case there, but they're going to give another $10 billion to Ukraine. But I started things off with, with Yellen, a.k.a. Boris Johnson and... We made it all the way to, uh, to banning TikTok in the European uh, Commission. And, 
and Biden's nuclear nuclear czar, whatever this was, the nuclear czar that was fired for stealing suitcases at airports. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's that's the video. <laughs> the Duran.locals.com. We are also on Rockfin as well. And here we go. The Duran shop, 10% off. Use the code good day. And by the way, there is um, having some trouble uploading to BitChute. My the videos on my channel to BitChute. I'm sorting that out and uh, I'll get everything sorted out with the videos on BitChute. Hopefully today or by tomorrow as well. I'll uh, I'll get that upload issue sorted out. So uh, that's the video. Take care.